My name is Bernice Condy. I'm an Aboriginal elder and I'm 75 years old. I was born in 1936. And I'm a member of the council at FEA, the committee. And I do shell stringing and basket weaving and kelp work and you name it, I do it. <laughs> I was born in Launceston and I came back to Flinders, I think, when I was about two years old. And uh, my parents used to run a mutton bird shed on Babel Island and it was a family business and... Um, I worked in that shed until I was about 14 and uh, after that we moved to Launceston so we could go to school over there, went to Brooks High School. Uh, and then when I was 19 I moved to Victoria. I was married there, had three children came back here to do a mutton bird season and moved back. It's the only place to be on Flinders Island. <laughs> and since then I've had a processing shed, mutton bird shed since I've been back here. I've been back about, oh God, 35 years or something, something like that. Uh, even as a kid I'd find shells on the beach and I used to pinch my father's fishing line to string him up. I've always been a shell person. If I'm walking on the beach, I'm looking for shells. And I've, um, Auntie Louie Brown, she was, used to do shell stringing out of those tiny little uh, rice shells. Some of her work's up in the museum here in Flint. Some of mine's up there too. And, um, I just picked it up from there and started stringing and it just went on from there. It just seems to come natural though. Well, it does to me, if you're Aboriginal. <laughs> yeah, but I've got, I've got English, Scottish and Irish blood and Aboriginal blood. So I'm a bit of a mixture. They live in the sea and they breed on kelp, some on ribbon reed and the, the big um, uh, king mariner, which is a shell about that big, breeds on the bull kelp. You don't find many of those, but you might find two or three every five years or something. Um, and you collect when, on spring tides, um, and you take a bucket into the sea and you, because you can't pull the kelp off the bottom because it'll just float away and die, you put the kelp over your bucket and pick the shells off. And you might do this for eight hours, six, seven, eight hours. And you might get enough to, of the same size to make a small bracelet but it could take two to three months to get all the same size to start doing a string. And I find that the shells come, seem to come into the shallow waters when it's warm to breed. And of course you only pick the shell, you leave the smaller shells, otherwise the, they just die out. You can't take everything off the kelp. You must leave something there for the, for it to continue. Um, and it's like it's only certain times of the year that you can do this. Collect your shells, which is probably uh, February, March, April. And in those three months of the year's year, you um collect your shells and from the time you get them out of the sea to the stringing stage takes about two and a half to three months when you it takes about five or six weeks through um, 
rot the fish out. You have to let them rot naturally, put them outside in a container. or And that takes about, yeah, six weeks. Um, then you wash them and get the stench out of the shell. Then you clean them with a spirit, which I'm not telling you what it is. Um, <laughs> and then you dry them all and grade them. And then you um, drill these mariners you have to, because they're so hard, they're drilled, the hole that's in them is drilled with a little craft drill. But the um, rice shell, of course, you can't drill them, they're so small. You just push them through the needle. You you lose a hell of a lot, but it's worth it when you finish a string because they're worth a fortune. <laughs> lot I don't do. I don't use um, uh, clips on my jewellery because it's not traditional. But a lot of Aboriginal women now that are stringing. Um, they do put the clips on them, and I refuse to do that because they don't look natural. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, that's what I do. When I think about my life, it was best when I was a child going to school. Part of it was um, part of my school life wasn't very good because Aboriginal kids were treated different to the white kids. They weren't classed as the same sort of people. But, yeah, when I was a kid, because um, you'd go... We used to have play houses up, up on the Vinegar Hill. We'd go up there and run wild, climb trees, go to the beaches, go swimming, chasing kangaroos. And in those times, we'd eat a lot of... Um, um, traditional tucker, like things we used to call tater vines, used to grow on a vine and they were very, they were shaped like a cucumber only, they were very small. And um, uh, kanigong, the fruit on the kanigong and the prickly box that has the red berries and the grass tree, the, the middle of the grass tree, the black boy, is got a sweet sort of um, coconut in the middle of it and, and we'd split them and get handfuls of that need. Actually, I made some... I had a traditional wedding here about a month ago. I did most of the catering and I did the ice cream out of the yakka gum bread and everybody was just absolutely dumbfounded. <laughs> And like we'd go uh, catch crayfish, we'd um, have a piece of rope or a piece of string, strong string, tie a rock on it and a mutton bird. And we'd go down the cracks of the rocks and um, you'd get a couple of crayfish, three or four crayfish, pull them up real slow and grab hold of the horns and, and abalone and... All good stuff. <laughs> I felt like the best part of my life. Um, when we moved to Launceston, and it was totally different. We um, were treated over there at school exactly the same as we were here on Flinders Island. Like people would look at you and but it's not like that anymore I just I could say something but I'd be swearing <laughs> <So I won't. laughs> yeah no I'd rather had, had a good life most of those things um, they're still in your mind but you um, just let it pass by if you, if you let it worry you, you'd be in the bloody nut house. But, yeah, people are totally different here now. Mm. We all join in together. In that, those times, you didn't need a licence to go and get your fish. You could just go 
stand on the rocks and go fishing or you could catch a crayfish or get an abalone or now everything's licensed. You can't do those things that you used to do years ago. Even there's a quota on fish now. All shellfish, everything. You can only catch so many a day. And if you're caught with more than that, you get fined. So it's not like just to be free, like you could run, as I was saying, you could run wild. If you wanted to go and get a fish, you could. Mountain bird season was my favourite part of the year because we knew for two and a half to three months we wouldn't have to go to school anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Because we um, used to take the dogs and the chooks and whatever other animal onto the bird island. And in that, when I was a kid, it used to be there for two and a half months. You'd go there about three weeks before the season started to clean up, get the house ready, the processing shed, um, cut the wood. We used to carry wood on our back from Bullhead Scrub, which is in the middle of the island, to... Yeah, because we didn't have cars or tractors or any of that sort of stuff over there. And all the floors were grass. In the house it was, you know, that tussie grass, silver tussie. Um, we'd cut that and spread on the floor. That was our floor over there. But the processing shed was cement because you had to have, um, you couldn't have the dirt coming up through things. Yeah, and the walls were, we used to save the newspapers for the old 12 months and we'd paper the walls with them, so all the cracks and holes and <laughs> yeah, it was good fun. And most of the process, there was something like 30 sheds or something on, on um, Babel Island in those days, um, but now there's only one which is out, Tasmanian Aboriginal land count. And all the sheds and the houses that was there, idiots like fishermen would go, go, away, or go ashore and, and um, set fire, burn the houses down and smash the windows and kick walls in and there's nothing left anymore. Was There's that... millions and millions of birds that you would never catch because you only take the chick, you don't take the mother bird. Because, um, and it's amazing, they fly thousands, millions of miles and they do a figure eight, which is, and then they come back here to breed in November, isn't it, John? It's not there. Yeah, November. And the season starts on the 27th of March. And it finishes at the end of April now, which is only, what, about five weeks. And when I was a kid, it would go for a couple of months. And most of our birds then were salted, put in brine and salted because you never had freezers or fridges or anything over there on the islands, but now they've got their um, cool room and they just boat them over in, put them in the freezer. A lot of them are sold fresh, whereas before it was, everything was salted. And our main source of food when we was on the island was mutton birds, fish and kangaroo. Wallaby. What I remember is well, the, the scallop guys from all over Tassie would bring their fish in here. We'd have a factory going. And it was work for a lot of women. Well, oh, God, we split, must have split scallops for about 20 years. But now that doesn't happen anymore. There's no, there's a processing shed here, but they don't use it anymore because of there's so much bloody red tape you have to go through to start off a fishing processing um, factory. Um, the guy that owns it now breeds abalone in it. But yeah, we used to fill it, 
Fia had a factory too, fish factory. We used to fill it um, shark and used to cook crays and uh, split scallops and any sort of fish. And that folded um, and now there's nothing. If you're not a farmer or a fisherman or retired, well, it's not the place to be. <laughs> Where I live in Lady Barron, um, the bay down the front used to have the blue mariners and um, you could probably get them down there about four or five months of the year. Um, they'd come in there to breed, but um, because of the creek, and the sewerage that goes into the sea, all the kelp's rotted off and you just can't get those shells there anymore. Um, John and I do a lot of driving, travelling around the islands looking, or in the dinghy boat, um, looking for the shells to find until or unless they get uh, the proper sewerage plant here on Flinders Island and Lady Barron, it'll just keep on going into the sea and the kelp will just die off and and um, like even at the wharf when um, the boats are at the wharf and you can and from the motors you can see like oil on the water. Even a lot of ships in one particular place, boats in one particular place all the time with all that coming out of the boats, that does damage to the, the kelp and the shells and like a lot of the shells around that area is all corroded They're, and you can't use them. They grow like some sort of a, a hard corally thing over the top of them. <laughs> we mainly go around the islands now because we just can't get them here. Okay. And they will be less and less and less and eventually, <laughs> which will be sad, there will be no shells around to collect. Like I've taught my sisters out of string and I was teaching the Aboriginal kids in, out, up at the school, but they don't realise the value of the shells and what you do to get them, and they just pulled them and broke them and too young to, to, learn, to do the stringing, especially when you're using your own shells. But, yeah, I've taught a lot of people. I've had a few workshops on Cape Barron teaching the kids over there. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's going to be a day that you won't be able to collect these shells anymore. Which is sad, isn't it? Um, like, and, and if we don't teach the young kids this sort of thing, it'll die out and, and they've lost a part of their culture. They have no idea what it's all about. Like um, one of the the um, the girls that work up at Fia take the kids in a bus, and they go around the beaches, and they're explained to the kids the kelp they breed on, uh, what what you look for, and all that type of stuff. But they don't realise, as I said, they don't realise the value of the shells. They'll break them or... Kids today are not interested. They're more party kids and want to go to movies and... Unfortunately, they're not interested in... in their traditional stuff. I even take... I've taken kids out in the bush, out in the scrub to show them what native foods you can eat. And they go out that once with me, but they never continue it on. So when I did this wedding with all the traditional foods, I had um, the berries and like abalone, crayfish, um, weriners, 
Ekagam ice cream, berries, and oh, everybody was amazed. The first time that they know of that it's been a traditional wedding on Flinders Island. And like their vows wasn't um, exchanging rings, it was exchanging the shell necklace to their partner. They had, don't wear the rings, they, the necklace does the job. which was really teary in some places of the wedding. <laughs> my father was a fisherman. Brothers, my father, my partner. When, when I was a kid, all, that was the only thing that was fishing and, of course, the farmers. But that was it. And um, there was used to be one shop in White Mark Now you can go to, in White Mark, you can go to one, two, three, three different pa pl places to eat. Yeah. There used to be only one. We've got a golf club, you know. <laughs> what is special about it is because I collect my shells around the coast. Um... What is different about it is um, things don't happen around the coast that used to happen, like fishing and going out in groups and having a barbecue and catching abalone. Um, and a lot of the coastline is washed away, as you probably noticed, like here in Lady Barron. The, um, the sea is about 50 metres away and the banks are still washing away and the trees are falling into the sea, which we've approached the council about, putting sandbags or some, some sort of thing that would hold the banks there, but that's never happened. And this has been going on for years. And you can see now it would be about 15 to 20 feet from the road. And... There used to be houses on that side of the road, on the sea side of the road, which is, you can never build there now because it's all washed away. My grandparents lived on the other side of the road. So that's how much it's washed away in about 80 years or, and are still doing that. You have no idea the seas and the wind we get here. And it just keeps on taking everything out to sea. And in the next 50 years, there won't be a coast road. You'll have to go out your back door. That's how much it's been washed out. Mm. You walk along that beach, you'll see all the roots where the, the, sea, the sea's taken the soil away and there's just roots and then eventually they fall down. Mm trees fall down. What the coastline and the water's done for Flinders Island people, yeah. well it was their main source of food really with the, the fishermen and because we never ever had a butcher shop here. We, you'd barter with the, with the farmers and give them a crayfish or something, get a, a um, piece of lamb off there was a lot of bartering going on. Even the women, the Aboriginal women that did the shells on Cape Barren Island, the shell necklaces, they used to bring them to Flinders and barter with the, the shops for their food and, and petrol and just about everything. They'd barter and they'd, the bread and... Our main source of bread here on Flinders Island was what we call Johnny Cakes which is a damper, which is made from self-raising flour. And to have bread processed by a baker's shop, we never ever seen that. But as the years went on, we did um, have a baker's shop here. And, yeah, the bread was totally different to what we was used to. <laughs> but even now, I still make a damper.
especially if we have mutton boots. And I mean, the if the if the sea doesn't process the food that the mutton birds eat, they that the mutton birds eat, yeah, that they'll just they'll die because they can't. They go to the sea to get the food for their their babies, and then they fly back to the hole and and feed the babies. And it's quill. And if there's none of that around, it's <laughs> the end of the mutton bird season. Well, our future does um, depend on the ocean and the coast because um, that's where I get my um, shells from, the sea, um, and the coast for the fishermen. Like I remember years ago there used to be about 30 fishing boats on Flinders Island fish around Flinders Island and local people that lived here but now I think there's three there's three boats that uh, two cray fishermen two boats actually that fish around here now all the rest are just given up and gone and two boats those people depend those fishermen depend on the sea for their for their dollars. It's mainly all farming here now. And I mean, the farmers even depend on the weather. If it's a dry season, they have to buy their um, hay and that from Tassie and have it shipped over. If we don't get the rain, the grass stops. I think just about everything on Flinders Island depends on the weather and the sea and yeah, without that there wouldn't be a Flinders Island. There'd be no people living there, only um, the poor old elderly. <laughs>